Okay, well, welcome everybody to this meeting of the virtual IMS user group. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Trevor Edels. I'm CEO of iTechEd Limited. We're a mainframe consultancy analysis and technical authoring organization. We're responsible for the content on the virtual IMS website, and we also produce newsletters. And uh, if you've not been on the website, you can find it at itech-ed.com forward slash virtual IMS. And if you've got colleagues who uh, work on kicks, we also look after the virtual CICS user group. Okay, uh, first of all then, I'd like to run through the agenda for this meeting. As usual, most of the meeting will be taken up with the presentation. And today our guest presenters are Al Surat, a principal at Maintegrity Inc. and Gary Euler, a consultant at Maintegrity. And their talk is called Making IMS the Most Secure System on the Planet. And a copy of the slides from this presentation will be on the website later today. And by the way, if you've missed any of our previous meetings, you can download copies of the presentations from our website. And you can also listen again to them. There's a link on our resources page. So following Al and Gary's presentation and any questions you have for them, we'll move on to the latest IMS news, the latest IMS related articles. Feedback request is there to remind me to ask you for your feedback about this virtual meeting. And then I'll give you the dates and times for the next couple of meetings. So that's the plan for this meeting. And I'm anticipating that it will last for about an hour. Anyway, as I just said, today's presentation is from Al Surat and Gary Euler. Al is a principal at Maintegrity Inc. and is dedicated to improving security on mainframes and other platforms. For over 35 years, he's delivered innovative solutions for enterprise IT problem areas with a strong operations background. He's a regular speaker at uh, International Security Conference and has authored many IT industry thought leadership papers. Uh, during his 35 years in the industry, Gary has held senior management positions in a variety of IT companies that were engaged in both software development and IT services. Gary has held senior positions as a technician, including as an IMS systems programmer, as a senior manager in IT delivery and in a variety of business development roles. So um, Al and Gary, I'd like to thank you very much for being with us today. And what I'd like to do now is pass control of the meeting over to you. So uh, thank you, Gary. Hi, thanks for listening. It seems every week these days there is yet another news story about a large ransomware attack or scam perpetrated by cyber criminals. I live in Canada and last week the news broke that even the venerated Royal Canadian Mounted Police had been impacted by a ransomware attack. I know it's a bit off, but I did chuckle to myself about that one. The aim of this webinar is to show you how to improve your ZOS security, including the IMS system to process credit cards, and outline a bit of about why it's important. The bad guys are getting craftier and scarier. We'll go over that a bit. We'll talk about how the bad guys get past rack up on your firewalls and talk a bit about what they can do when they do that. Then we'll talk about how FIM Plus can help with that. Now we'll talk about the ATM cash out attack that occurred last fall and of course how we can help with that and then we'll wrap up. But the point is is that it is time to take action against the bad guys. The bad guys tend to live in regimes where the ransoms they collect contribute to the gross national product of their host country, and they are mostly immune to prosecution. The only solution in this situation is better defense. FIM Plus can provide better defense, include early warning of a breach, and save you time and effort in your quest for better PCI compliance. And if you ever get breached, automatically gather the forensics and put you back on the road to recovery in minutes. To do a trial, FI installs in a half a day or less. FI Plus will save you time and improve your security. If you don't have the half a day to invest, this session probably isn't for you. 
hacking has come a long way. It started out a long, long time ago and was done primarily by nerdy thrill seekers trying to break into various sites so they could impress their friends. In the late 1980s, viruses came along and have been with us ever since. In the early days of viruses, the motives were more diverse than with penetration hacks. The hackers were now, in many cases, starting to try to steal or hurt an organization for activist reasons. These attacks are more sophisticated than straight penetration hacks because of the self-replicating nature of the viruses. A fairly big change begins to occur in the hacking space in the 2000s. Teams of hacker, hackers working together start to pull off these increasingly sophisticated and lucrative ransomware hacks. Of course, not to be left out, organized crime and government start to get in the act. We're seeing some absolutely incredible attacks. The solar winds attack required cunning, patience, and a high degree of sophistication. The recent Colonial Pipelines hack shut down a large pipeline network in the eastern U.S. Darkside, the group blamed for the attack, has apparently been paid 90 million U.S. dollars over the period of September 2020th through May 2021. This is according to a CNBC article. They have apparently been shut down, but with numbers this big, you have to think a replacement group is either operating already or will certainly start up. It's 2021. This slide is amazing to me. In a past life, I used to be an IMS systems program. This was in the 80s, and at that time, it was one of our mantras that our systems and applications that we supported would likely not last through the millennium. Look at this now. According to IBM, and I don't think they're being self-serving here, fully 80%, 87% of all credit card transactions are processed on a ZOS computer. They don't talk about how many of those are IMS or CICS, but I would venture that it is most, if not all of them. I did the math. This is $6.9 trillion worth of transactions on ZOS, and these stats are from before the pandemic. You have to wonder how big the dollar volume is in today's pandemic-ridden world. By the way, it occurs to me that you folks must have excellent job security. Sooner or later, with the size of the prize being that large, someone is going to go after it. By definition, criminals are sneaky. They will get legitimate credentials in any way they can, including buying them on the dark web. Really bad people are getting involved in the hacking profession. To counter these threats, many governments, most recently Joe Biden in the US, are calling for implementing zero trust infrastructures. We're going to show how FIM Plus can be a cornerstone in combating these threats and help put a zero trust architecture in place. With the tried and true conventional security measures, RACA, top secret, and ACF2, and firewalls, what you're doing is limiting access to known and trusted people. These tools are very good at that. However, bad actors can steal credentials or get them from the dark web. And also, previously good employees can succumb, succumb to addiction or have gambling problems, and then in order to get money, sell you out. The point here is that the insiders are past rack up in the firewall. A criminal with stolen credentials is indistinguishable from a legitimate employee. Although having a bad guy steal credentials or an employee go rogue is very low risk, again, the consequences can be devastating to your organization. So what kinds of things can bad actors do if they get past your if they get past your perimeter security and onto your mainframe. A simple Google search will turn up an impressive array of mainframe hacking tools. Many of these are uploaded by well-meaning penetration testers. The list on the right side of the slide is a partial list of the tools that come up during a Google search. There are many, there, there are a bunch of NMAP scripts which attack your mainframe from the outside. These ones actually don't worry me too much. Most people will detect a brute force attack. However, there is a database, an Iraqi database parser. With this, you can find out which IDs have special access and that kind of thing. My personal favorites are on the left side of the screen. It's a series of Rec C lists which can discover all kinds of things, including system libraries, IPL parameters, map a complete catalog, get lists of members from PDSs or PDSEs. It's quite a lot of information. One of the things which has historically been a blessing in the mainframe space is that mainframe testing facilities are largely out of reach of the lone hackers. But with the emergence of organized criminal and state sponsor attacks, mainframe testing facilities are no longer out of reach. So what does a ransomware attack look like? This slide will pull all of this together. A sophisticated hacker will 
the sum or all of the following steps outlined on the screen. Reconnaissance phase. This is a pre-attack phase. In this phase, the bad actor will learn everything it can about the target organization. This may include searching LinkedIn for information on employees of the company, looking for public email addresses, reviewing job postings, press releases, and that kind of thing. They're seeking insiders that may help them, and they're also trying to understand if there is a corporate event where if the brands of demand is made at that time, it will cause maximum problems and embarrassment for the corporation. Think about having a ransomware attack happen just as your company is about to close a major deal. The penetration phase is a step we talked about previously. The criminals will look for a way to get a user ID and password. Because they have researched the company, they may craft an email that sounds legitimate but includes a payload, which will get them the information they need to get in. With the billion or so sets of credentials that Troy Hunt has discovered on the dark web, they may just get them there. <clears throat> the fortification phase is where attackers try to hide evidence of their entry and they establish redundant methods of accessing the device and investigate methods to affect compromised system components. In this phase, malware may be loaded on your system using utilities like FTP. In the infiltration phase, this phase is where the attacker will search the backup data and seek to gain higher credentials and identify the files which, if they're encrypted, will cause the maximum disruption to the company. <clears throat> the spoliation phase, as spoliation is a fancy word that means to ruin something. In this phase, the hackers will ruin the backups or modify the backup of procedures so they appear to work, but don't. And then finally, after your backups have been compromised, the hacker will encrypt parts of your system and make sure that only they have the decryption key and email the ransom demand. If you pay the ransom, remember that although these people are pretty sophisticated, they are still bad people. You may or may not get the decryption key to unlock your system. One more thing on paying the ransom. <clears throat> if you, there is a school of thought that says you shouldn't pay the ransom. By paying the ransom, you're simply encouraging more attacks. I think that's one of those things that's fairly easy to say if you are sitting in the decision-making chair. If I was sitting in that chair and paying the ransom was the only way to get my system back, I think I know what I would do. So how can you counteract these types of threats? If you assume that they can penetrate past rack F and your firewall, what can you do? Well, f Plus helps you with the fortification, infiltration, and spoliation phases of a ransomware attack. The idea being that if you detect the issues, you can force the final step of the ransomware attack. The rest of this presentation will focus on counteracting these threats and show how state-of-the-art security techniques, which were formerly only available on other platforms, are now available on ZOS. Remember, if you have any questions before we move on, you can type them into the question box and we'll answer them at the end. FIM Plus is a feature-rich product. It's designed to operate in a modern ZOS environment. Maintegrity has taken FIM way beyond creating hash codes and verifying that your files haven't changed. The list on the screen represents the features we have implemented that help you detect and thwart ransomware attacks. We're going to go over all of these in some detail in the following slides. FIM Plus is a highly automated enterprise system. It will detect changes to files, then it will enable you to take action automatically via preset action definitions. For instance, and we will go over this, but if FIM Plus detects a change or add a file, it will initiate actions that you have defined. You may want to check in your change management system to see if a change request exists for this change, and if not, take a more serious set of actions than if one does exist. Because FIM Plus integrates with other tools in your enterprise, it's a really, really powerful ally in your defense against brands. Spag listing is recommended by many organizations as something that should be done to counter ransomware. The reference on the slide is to a U.S. government interagency document written to provide organizations a framework on protecting themselves from these types of attacks. There are quite a number of agencies mentioned on the title page, but they include the FBI, the Department of Justice, Homeland Security, and a number of others. What is whitelisting? The definition on the slide is from the National Institute of Standards and Technology or NIST as they are commonly referred to. Basically, a whitelist describes in a baseline the programs that are authorized to run in your processor and notifies you if any of those programs change or if any other programs have been added or deleted. In the 
in this paper reference, they do indicate that the best way to implement whitelisting is by using a file integrity monitoring technology. They also describe that some of these FIM solutions just detect changes and notify you about the changes, but the really good ones detect, notify, and take action. FIM Plus is in the latter category. Al will go to this a little bit more later on, but we can automatically quarantine a suspicious file. We could even delete it, although that's probably not your best strategy. These types of actions can be set up to occur when the change is detected without human intervention. In the FIM solution, some auto discovery features are provided to help you build baselines on your system software. FIM Plus will auto discover your API libraries and your product program product libraries, including JES, CICS, and DB2. This technique can automatically start building your whitelist within minutes of installation. Of course, you can create baselines for in-house developed or purchased applications. Another thing FIM Plus can do is support multiple baselines. Why? Well, if you're rolling out a new version of an application across many LPARs, you may want to have some LPARs on version X and some on version Y during the rollout. FIM Plus has the capability to support that. The benefit to customers of implementing whitelisting is that malware cannot get placed on your system without triggering an alert. This capability provides you with knowledge of changed files, even when a change was created by a user ID that had the authority. Notifications, <clears throat> including emails or text notifications to your response team, occur automatically so your response can get initiated as soon as changes are detected. The central banks in both North America and in Europe are recommending that banks do checksums on their backup files to validate their integrity on an ongoing basis. The cyber resilient resilience oversight document that was created by the European Central Bank in 2018 to provide guidance to member banks on improving cyber resilience. It is a well-written document. If any of you are interested, Integrity has written a companion document outlining where we can help in meeting the expectations that are set out in that document. We'd be happy to share that with you. So we were working with a large Canadian bank to provide them check some of the backups. One of their issues was that they had backup data sets where, that were a terabyte and more of data. When you go to do a full scan on a terabyte of data, it could take a long time. In order to reduce the time to complete a scan on these very large backup data sets, we have implemented the capability to do sample scans. Sample scans will create a hash code from a subset of the data contained in the file. The amount of data sampled in the scan is user specifiable. Every time you create a hash code to verify the file, a new hash code can be created to sample different data from the data sampled in the current scan. You can also have a scan that just verifies the first and last block in the file. This is for virtual tape files only. As we discussed, because the sophisticated bad guys target backups in the pre-ransom phase of the attack, it's very useful to make sure that your backups have not been tampered with and notify you the second that they have. We think the central banks are particularly worried about backups in major banks because a ransomware attack on a major bank could have a ripple effect throughout the entire financial market infrastructure. Whether sampling scans meet your validation requirements is really up to you and your auditors. I'm going to pass this along to Al though, but we're first going to run a little poll and then Al will talk in some more detail about some of the other features we have to counter ransomware. Before I do that, I'd just like to say thanks for listening and stay safe. Al, over to you. Thanks, Gary. Um, <clears throat> I know Trevor's uh, going to put up the uh, poll for us, but I think as we've uh, been more involved in the industry, we've really found that uh, the concept of file integrity monitoring and knowing what's going on inside the walls in your environment have become much more important. Not only that, really, these hackers are very resourceful these days. We're only starting to find out where they're already in. And, and you know, one of my challenges to the audience today is I, do you understand whether hackers are already inside the walls in your environment? The dark web, uh, as Gary alluded to, has has thousands and thousands and thousands of user IDs. I certainly hope uh, they're not particularly yours. But you know, mainframe security is really important with nation states taking this on as employment for people that live there. 
it can only be a limited amount of time before the mainframe itself is attacked. And there are big outages in the banking industry as a result. So we're seeing a lot of changes in, in the need for banking resiliency. And, and you're going to see in a couple of minutes in the, uh, in the follow on portion of the presentation, um, you know, how that plays into a PCI context. Uh, Trevor, uh, any thoughts from you? Uh, no, I'm, I'm just, uh, the poll should be up. People should be able to do the poll at the moment. Well, I'm going to fill mine in because I don't have any of these doggone problems. So I'm just going to say we don't have any user IDs or passwords out in the wild. But I, I think it'll be uh, interesting to see uh, how big an issue this is uh, for our audience. It's uh, I, it certainly is a big deal in terms of uh, what's happening in the marketplace today. We've got uh, yeah, 12, 12 people have done it already. One person's doing it. The others haven't, haven't clicked on it yet. I'll give them a few more minutes to uh, have a think about what they'd like to click. Uh, yeah, I, I, it is, uh, I, I, it was a bit shocking to me, uh, I, again, in terms of Gary's content, uh, it's a bit shocking to me that, that this has really become employment and that all these hacks are so commonly available. Um, I mean, you don't really have to be all that smart. You just have to be really, really patient and grind away at it until uh, you find that one weak link. And now you got control, and once I've got control, man, I can cause a lot of problems. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, that there's a long time in this stealth mode. Once people are into your network, into your computer, while they're um, just sort of getting everything right for them, and that, that's the time when you need to uh, actually spot it and sort of oik them out. Uh, so, Trevor, I. I you know, if you've got the results to the poll um, that you can show us, maybe we'll look at that, or or we I can just start into the rest of the converse, uh, presentation however you like. No, because I'll, I'll have to close the poll before we move on. Uh, what I'll say is 15 people have done it, three people it's telling me are in progress. So uh, let's give them a second or two to finish, and then I'll close the poll. Perfect. So, well, yeah. I'll be kind of interested to see what the results are like. Yes, yes, me too. Let's see. And for our audience uh, upcoming, uh, you know, we'd really like to be challenged on, on some of the things that you're dealing with in real life every day. So, you know, sometimes when you're developing software, you need to hear from real people about real problems. Um, so if if you think about our question and answer period at the end, uh, I'd love you to be active. And Trevor, if you've got any uh, burning issues that you need to get out, uh, good time for uh, for for the inquisition. You can uh, you can ask us whatever pointed questions you really like. Okay, well I, I'll certainly take you up on that opportunity then. Um, right, I am going to close the poll now. No one seems to have done anything for a little while. Let's close the poll. They're telling me now. Just waiting, waiting for 10 seconds for everyone to finish. Chug, chug, chug. Coming along. Right, let's see. Right. Can, you, can you see the poll results? I can. Okay, because I can't. Strangely enough. Okay, do, 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 do just have a quick summary for us, Al? Yeah, it seemed like uh, um, the question E for those uh, folks that responded, management uh, is uh, is concerned about this, and uh, and we think that they rightfully should be so. Uh, you know, as we go into the, the balance of the presentation, uh, you know, we, we'd like to make it very clear that we're focused on this problem. But we're focused on this problem 
I think in terms of real solutions, we understand that people on the call are busy and they're surrounded by a whole lot of things they have to do every day. So we're really trying to build, build in more capability um, uh, and more automation that actually reduces the overall amount of work that you have to do at the same time as we're Jesus able to Christ. improve your security. So uh, with not much better, with not much more than that, uh, perhaps I'll just go on uh, with the rest of the presentation, uh, if that's good with you, Trevor. Yeah, just give me one second. Let's see if I can, if I can just save the results. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's uh, carry on. Let me just share this for you. FIM plus detection by scan on a scheduled or on-demand basis. The first scan creates a baseline set of component features and hash keys also called a whitelist from your trusted system and application components. Keys are stored in an encrypted vault. The vault supports multiple versions of keys corresponding to different levels of software during your rollout process. The correct version can be automatically updated during the deployment of a new release. Subsequent scans generate a new set of up to the minute keys and compares them to the baseline version. If the keys are the same, we say everything is good and write a success record to the FIM log to the TRSIM tool. FIM Plus continues to do scanning on a regular basis decided by the customer. Typically, we find that everything matches and there aren't any problems. However, one day we encounter an unknown change. Then, FIM Plus raises a real-time alert and sends it via email or text to members of your response team. When they get the alert, all they have to do is click on the email and that brings up our 3270 or browser-based interface to guide them to the process. Since FIM Plus scans every component, when the GUI starts up, you already see everything that was affected so you know the scope of the attack. You also know the interval in which the attack took place. The last success record defines the beginning of the period and the time of failure marks the end. Once we know the interval, we can simply go to SML and fetch up to the second access records, but only with the ones for the failing components within the attack interval. This can reduce the number of records to be reviewed by an order of magnitude. And that means faster response with the right information and less, less chance of errors. Now you know who did it and exactly when. Next question, was it approved? Since we know the components affected, a single click will query the change control product to see if there was an approved update. By accessing common tools like BMC's Helix, ITSM, or ServiceNow, perhaps running in the cloud, you can locate any associated change records. If there is one, FIM fetches the reason for the change and displays it immediately. But what if there is no change record? Now we have a problem. For text-based components like config members or PARM settings, FIM Plus can invoke a side-by-side -side compare program. Now you can compare the baseline copy to the current copy so you can see if it was just a comment line that changed or whether it was something sinister. Meanwhile, an alert could be escalating through your SIM product like BMC's command center Spunk or Q radar. Communication between FAM Plus and the SIM tool is bidirectional. That means someone working on SIM can request services from FAM Plus, like initiating an on demand scan. Also, status and informational records can be interchanged on the fly. That's real interoperation, leading to a much more comprehensive response from your SIM. More action required? Now you know this is a real 
malicious attack. So we start the recovery. The FIM policy driven recovery process guides the way. Since you already know the offender, probably the first thing to do is request a suspension of the guilty user ID to prevent further damage. Next step, quarantine the altered components. FIM Plus can place anything affected in a walled off holding cell, preserving forensic data for later analysis. With fast backup verification, you'll be sure the hacker hasn't comprised your compromise your backups too. FIM Plus now invokes the recovery system. It already knows the right backups to use and when the affected components were last correct. So it can go out and build the correct restore jobs for you. Then you pull the trigger on restore with a clear conscience, getting back to the desired state in a fraction of the time required to do it manually. And of course, you can run a final verification scan to prove that everything came back correctly. Sounds simple? Well, it is. The bottom line here is how long does it take you to react? In a classic response, you hope your backups are okay. And you hope all your components haven't been maliciously altered, but you don't know. With FIM Plus, they do know. They either match or they don't. Using automated forensics, you have answers instead of questions right off the bat. Compared with the classic response, of getting all the experts together and lots of manual effort is like moving at light speed. Some security tools only report suspicious activity. FIM delivers clear corroborating evidence that can eliminate many false positives used by these products. By combining the information from complementary sources, you can high grade your alerts, detecting threat that bypass traditional defenses, but also validating the alerts raised are real or not. Now, whether you're a veteran security expert or someone relatively new to mainframes, you can make the right decisions based on rock solid validated information. We always like to say, knowledge plus action equals avoidance, not disaster. So how does that really help us deal with a ransomware attack? Well, we can't really stop the hacker from going to the dark web and getting a valid user ID for your site. It allows them to log on to perhaps an attached Windows machine. So they will be able to get some level of access, but then, we can stop them in their tracks. We have verified backups, so if they try to compromise, we'll give you an early warning. We, we see that our real-time alerts and our uh, automated forensics give you a way to react in a fraction of the time formerly, avail uh, formerly required. So fast, fast reaction either keeps you on air or gets you back in here, but it certainly prevents the fact that you have to look at paying the ransom. We know by the scope of everything that was affected, so we don't have to spend weeks trying to find out what that hacker actually got into. The final analysis is we probably prevented that hacker from being able to implement a successful ransom attack. So you don't pay a ransom, you simply use our recovery uh, facilities to get you back to a trusted state in record time. With FIM in place, you have already eliminated redundant effort and improved security. But now, let's talk about compliance. If you handle debit, credit card transactions, or support banking machines, you'll be governed by the payment card industry data security standard, PCI. FIM strengthens the many PCI controls. However, sections 10.5 and 11.5 make integrity monitoring an absolute requirement on every computer. As noted here, monitoring for unauthorized changes is required for log files, like image copies and SMF log logs, but also required for critical system data sets, configuration files, and other content. 
PCI 3.2.1 has been in effect for more than two years. And with version four now on the horizon, with strong reinforcement, this trend will become a tidal wave. Right now, some very important person in your organization has signed off that every computer is compliant with every section of PCI. But we all know FIM has never been available for COS before. So how are you going to explain that? Like everywhere, hackers are getting more resourceful all the time. Since most ATMs still hang on IMS FastPath, this PCI bulletin is recent and relevant. Each cash out attack costs millions in cash ripped out of banking machines, left vulnerable due to inadequate detection practices. It appears that parameters and programs were modified in the card management system. Obviously, someone with knowledge got access. As PCI notes, this may be an inside job, and altered the security settings, and then coordinated a very sophisticated attack. This bulletin again reinforces not once, but twice, that continuous monitoring with FIM tools is urgently required. And they are not alone. Nearly every security expert now focuses on the need for internal threat detection. Do nothing at your own peril. So, implementing better security gets you partly to compliance. Now all you have to do is prove it during an audit. Proving compliance manually with a NIST whitelist or PCI monitoring requirement is nearly impossible. Automation to the rescue again. This slide shows you a sample audit report. Standards call for such a report to be created and stored on a weekly basis. By allowing FIM tools to do this, you will be able to prove compliance without lifting a finger. However, if that isn't good enough, invite your auditor with a couple of clicks to run their own report on demand whenever they want. In the real-time world, though, weekly reporting doesn't cut. It. That's why big tools give you a browser-based interface so that you can bring it up anytime to run your own forensics. Using modern tools means that even folks that are less experienced on the mainframe can look at all the relevant info and make the right decisions. When the President of the United States starts talking about a paradigm shift in cybersecurity and gives federal departments 60 days to come up with a plan, you know we are talking about something important. Zero trust is just that kind of concept. An August 2020 Zero Trust Report by Price Waterhouse Coopers provides the accompanying chart. You can see that FIM is positioned as a required technology for zero trust enablement. We understand that there are many different definitions of what zero trust really requires, but I think it is safe to say that achieving it without being able to prove that your systems and applications top to bottom have integrity would be a futile task. FIM provides a foundational piece of your response by providing absolute clarity on whether an asset is in its trusted state or has been altered is essential to removing bias from the trust no asset assertion. Well, we've had a nice talk about improved security and compliance, but in the real world, everybody's busy. How the heck do I achieve this? Well, We've tried as best we can to make our product help you do that. The auto discovery function can get you up and running very quickly. It'll start detecting changes that bypass your existing tool. You can respond to incidents far faster with much more clarity 
and assurance that you're doing the right thing with the advanced forensics. We can go through all the rest of it, but at the end of the day, we're operations guys. We're here to help you make your job easier. That means less work, less places where things can screw up, and a higher degree of certainty that you've made the right decisions. And even if you're away from the office one day, other people can make the right decisions in your absence. We can run all of this stuff, stuff self-contained on your mainframe. Or we can, in real time, update your security console and interrogator query, uh, your change control systems, so that the system is working for you. It's doing the kind of thing that you would do manually if you only had time. SIM Plus was designed to save time. If you want to talk to an expert, take a little deeper dive and see how that's accomplished, or discuss your specific needs, we'd be happy to talk to you. But the asset test is really an express trial. It's free and probably can be conducted in a couple of days. Yep, from the time you try the auto discovery function until you've wrapped up your testing, you'll be surprised at how much time you actually save. Keep the whitelist that the system builds for you in the first couple of hours as something of value that we produced on your very first day. But in the longer term, what you really want is to win the fight against hackers. FIM Plus is a great tool in doing that. Right. All right, thanks, Al. Um, you did invite me to ask questions. Um, are you happy if I do ask you a question? Uh, I'm I'm ready for questions, and I'm sure Gary is. Uh, too. So, uh, you know, Trevor, uh, as they uh, come in from the field or if you've got any uh, uh, secret questions that you uh, want to get an answer to from us, we're, we're happy to help out. Uh, yeah, well, I've got uh, a couple then that uh, I thought of as you were going through. I mean, you kept talking about saving time, but, well, as we all know, systems programmers are already stretched. So, Tell us just how much extra work is involved in installing your software. Um, I, why don't I start that, Gary, and then I'll I'll, I'll turn things over to you because you're more of an expert on the on the install process and and what we've seen to date. But you know, we built this product <clears throat> from an operational standpoint. We understand. We really understand that you just don't have enough time in the day for all the competing efforts. So last thing we want to do is layer on more work. So uh, almost all of the features were, were built to spend, spend to save time. And uh, you know, the automation that drives everything is, is really important in that time-saving effort. We're taking a lot of manual processes and we're building them into the product. And it starts right from the get-go, right from the time when you install this on your system to begin with. Uh, you know, we try to make that easy and fast. And auto discovery is a real key in that. And with that, I'll, 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 I'll let Gary talk a little bit about, you know, what we've seen in the field. Because, I mean, it's always one thing for the software vendor to tell you, you know, how easy this is going to be. You know, sometimes you get in the field, results vary a little bit. So, uh, Garrett, maybe over to you on that. Okay, so the last um, installation we did a couple of weeks ago, the systems programmer was located in India. Um, well, one of the systems, the, the guy doing the installation, it's probably better to say, was located in India. The systems programmer, one of them was in Bulgaria. There was another one in the UK, and the security expert was in the US. Um, so there was there was a lot of moving parts in play from the time they got the software until the time it was operational it took us about a day and a half. But the issue was we had an ACF2 issue that took the security guy in the US, a, you know, a little while to resolve. 
and and it, and it was it was a specification that needed to be made in their test LPAR that wasn't normally made. Um, so, but that's how long it took. Normally, when you're going to do an installation, if you're a single site and you have all of the people who are doing the installation um, in 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 a similar in the same location. Uh, we typically can get the the system up and running in half a day um, or less. I, Does that I, answer the question? And Al was talking a little bit about auto discovery. Auto discovery is a kind of a, a slick way to get started building a whitelist. Um, we definitely do um, the we do uh, auto discovery in all of the APF libraries in your in your ZOS system plus program product libraries that are there. Um, and, and you know, you just sort of start it. It goes and discovers them, runs the first full scan, and then you just can run scans after that sort of ad nauseum. Does that answer the question? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so just, just confirm for me at a, at a typical site. Then, how long would you reckon it will take to install and, and get the first useful results from the product? Yeah. There again. Typically, typically, you know, if, if it depends on how complicated an environment it is. In a really complex environment like the one I described, it took us a day and a half. It could have gone a lot quicker, but um, there were there were some ACF2 issues we had to sort out. Um, so typically, you know, by the time you get the software, you get it installed, and you start running real real work, it's it's literally half a day. Wow. Well, okay. But I've got one more question then for, for both of you. It's all you keep sort of saying about time saving, but how much extra work will a typical sysprog have to do in a week in order to get anything useful out of the software? I, you know, you want I, my, I, I can start on this one, Al. If you want me, if you want sure. to rehearse this, I'll start and then you can run. Yep, good enough. <laughs> um, Typically, there is not much work for a systems programmer to do after the setup. Um, so here's the thing. So you, you set it up, you, you start running your scans automatically on some predefined schedule that you have. So there's there's some setup work. Um, then um, what happens is the only the only time you'll get an alert is if something changes, and you know we'll send you an email if there's been an alert, and then you have to do a little bit when we present all the forensic information on one screen in our browser, so you can go there looking and see what happened, you can see if it's an issue, and then you can take some action to either um, recover the file or decide that the change is legitimate and update the key in the library. Like that's all you have to do. It's not a big deal. Um, the, the thing you have to contrast that with is if you do have a breach. Um, and so the, the, the people that we've, we've heard from that did have a breach, and this was the famous Equifax, Equifax breach of a couple of years ago, when that got detected, they had to lock their systems programmers and security people in a room for about three months just to figure out how they were going to get back from it. Um, so you contrast the work that's required to recover from a breach with the work that's required to kind of run this system. It's it's just just not even a comparison at all. The other thing is, if you want to do PCI compliance, we can scan your files pretty much automatically because that's what happens, and we produce an audit report that uh, you know it, it it can be automatically emailed to whoever you want, and, and if you do that any other way, it's just it get you know it gets expensive. So it's a very cheap way to do that kind of thing. Al, over to you. That's all I wanted yeah. to say. Yeah, I, I I think think there was a couple of real good points there, and I I wouldn't mind expanding a little bit on things. Um, FIM Plus does absolutely find every change in your system. However, that could be a problem if if you didn't do it intelligently. So if it just exposes every change, well, geez, there's going to be a lot of changes going on uh, in the change window. There's going to be a lot of changes going on that are, that are legitimate. Well, I don't want a whole bunch of false alarms when that happens. So uh, we've taken that into consideration right from the get-go. So the um, the vault contains versions of all of your software. So if you're going from version 1.0 to 
we'll have both of those versions auto discovered and in the vault. And when you tell us it's going into production in the window, there's one little step that, that says tell uh, FIM plus that uh, you know 1.1 is now in production, not 1.0. So we'll go and test again against 1.1. And that does actually two things for you. It it actually validates that the the implementation process when you deployed it worked properly and everything's fine. And the other thing it does is it allows you to not have uh, issues, and there's no reason to have issues, where you're detecting changes that are legitimate. So in 99.9% .9 of the cases, we're frankly not going to show you any changes. But in the changes, in the case where those changes are correct, and it is the change window, and they're and they're authorized, we go through all that processing in the background for you to prove that what you just put into production is the right stuff. It's at the trusted level, and it's correct. So we like to think that this is much less effort than doing these often manual processes in any other way. So we don't think it's less work. We think it's actually a lot less work. So I, I hope that was a full answer to your question, Trevor. I bet you never expected that when we started down that road. No, that wasn't the answer I anticipated, yes. All right, thank you for that. Um, can I just say to anyone else on the call, if you've got a question, type it into the chat box or the Q&A and we'll uh, get Alan Gary to answer them now. Give me just, just a, a minute because I'm looking at the time. I guess the thing to do, I, I'm going to have my uh, email address on the screen in a, a little while. Um, Al or Gary, can you can you give your email addresses so if anyone thinks of something later, they can they can either contact me and I'll pass it on, or if they've made a note of your email, they can. Uh, yeah, you. I think they're I think they're on the first slide of the presentation, Trevor. Yeah. So yeah. if if they get if they want to get a hold of us, I think it's on the first slide of the presentation and the PDF that you're putting up on your site. But okay. the easiest yeah. the easiest way to get a hold of us, frankly, is go to www.maintegrity.com and there you will see kind of all a bunch of a bunch of different things about FAM plus how it works there's a uh, a YouTube video channel that goes along with things so if you've got five minutes and you want to find out how this works uh, there's five minute videos there's 40 minute videos that uh, that drill in and much more depth and uh, all of our contact information is there uh, or you can just Click the button that says check to an expert. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you'll probably get either Gary or me. Uh, so we're sort of as close to experts as you get. Okay, brilliant. Well, no, no one's actually typed anything in at the moment. So I think I'll move on. So can I thank you very much, uh, Gary and Al? Um, and because we're a virtual user group, can you assume that you're getting a virtual round of applause at this moment? Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Trevor. That was lots of fun. Yeah, and can I thank everyone who actually took part in the poll as well. Um, I will move on. Uh, let's go back to my... Yeah. So, um, normally I talk about uh, uh, IMS news at this stage, but uh, we don't seem to have any at this time. But... If you know of any, please let us know. And also, we normally talk about articles and blogs, but surprisingly, I haven't seen any in the uh, past couple of months. So again, if you know where any IMS related articles or blogs have been published, please get in contact. Uh, as always, can I ask for feedback about this meeting? My uh, email address is on screen or you can use the Contact Us web page on our website. So, coming soon then. Um, our next meeting is on the 10th of August when we've got Dougie Lawson, who uh, 
you may know from his contributions to the IMS listserv, and he's going to be giving his presentation from legacy to infinity and beyond. Um, following that then, it's the, oh, the show on the screen. Yeah, I'm following that, it's the 12th of October, uh, when we've got Karen Tisher, who some of you may know from doing training courses, and she's going to be talking about uh, oh, an overview of fast path DDBs. Just a reminder that you can keep up to date with what's happening in the world of IMS and on the virtual IMS user group website by following us on Facebook and Twitter and by joining the virtual IMS group on LinkedIn. The URLs are all on the homepage of our website. They're all on screen. Um, those of you who use Facebook, if you could like us, that would be nice. Everyone likes likes. And if you tweet or Insta or any of those, the hashtag to use is hashtag virtual IMS. Okay, well, that's all for this meeting of the virtual IMS user group. Can I thank you all for attending? Thanks to Rocket Software for sponsoring our user group. And I particularly want to thank Al Sorat and Gary Euler for today's presentation. So that's it. Thank you all very much for joining the meeting. And I look forward to seeing you on the 10th of August. So thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye.